My name is Tom Carpenter, and I'm the CTO at CWNP. And the topic of the webinar this month is an interesting one. It's uh, born out of some confusion and some issues that are out there in the marketplace of wireless technology related to 802.11ac and the various speed expectations that we have for it. But it is also a great learning opportunity for us. So instead of just talking about the issue, I want to address the issue from the perspective of helping us to really learn about the throughput expectations that we can have when it comes to 802.11ac environments. Because there is a bit of myth and misconception floating around out there about these issues. So what we're going to be doing is talking about the issue of 802.11ac myths of speed. And before we get into it, just a real quick reference here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at CarpenterTom and CWNP at CWNP. Our website, of course, is CWNP.com and CWNP TV is where we archive our webinars and other videos that we might post as well. So now what we're going to do is jump right in to our content for the day. The first thing I want to do is give you an agenda of what we're here to talk about. And there are really two topics we're going to address in relation to 802.11ac. And the first one is uplink requirements. And the second one is multi-user MIMO realities. So there are two issues there that have presented themselves. And we'll talk a little bit more about it in the marketplace. But you know the questions we want to answer are what do numbers like 1900 and 1750 and even 7200 mean? And the hint here, they're very misleading. They do not tell you anything about the throughput you can actually expect. The next question, what throughput can I expect from my 802.11ac AP? Well, the answer is far less than the highest potential data rate. So the old knowledge we've had forever that not all clients have the highest data rate is still true with 802.11ac. And do I really have to upgrade all of my switches to 10 gigabits per second Ethernet, or at least 2.5 or 5 or what have you? Well. Maybe, but it's not likely as urgent as you may think, at least not related to 802.11ac. Now, there may be other things moving you in that direction for sure, but what I want to really do is take advantage of the fact that a lot of people in various companies, will not mention any specific company names necessarily, are saying when you implement 802.11ac, particularly Wave 2, you have to have uplinks from the AP faster than 1 gigabit per second. Well, there certainly are use cases where it's true. But the reality is we can have this as a great learning opportunity about actual throughput expectations for 802.11ac while we address the fact that for most deployments it's actually a myth that you would need more than one gigabit per second. We'll get to that as we go along. Now here's some interesting marketing information. All right, This is actual marketing information for a product on the market. I have simply replaced the name of the product of course with very little effort I'm sure you could find this actual product because this is exact text from their marketing. It says this, game, share, and stream in 4K on Wi-Fi faster than gigabit Ethernet with the name of product here. The wireless router runs multiple bands and actually this one runs three in fact, one at 2.4 gigahertz and two at 5 gigahertz to reach speeds of up to 7200 megabits per second. Hold on a second, speeds or data rates and what does speed mean? And are you saying that a single client can communicate at 7200 megabits per second? Or are you somehow aggregating the three radios to give us this totally mythological 7200 megabits per second? The point is that we're talking about data rates when we see that 7200 megabits per second right there. And that's not what most people think of when they think of speed, particularly just the regular user. The regular user doesn't think about Wi-Fi data rates. They think about how fast is my data going across or through the network. And that's very different than the Wi-Fi link data rate because, well, there's overhead and other things we'll talk about. It goes on. It says, its leading edge antenna design sends strong, reliable Wi-Fi across your home and new beam steering technology directs Wi-Fi along the clearest path to devices. The router uses multi-user MIMO. Look out, a buzzword without any defined value coming at you. And four stream, here's another one, to reduce wait times and increase Wi-Fi speeds. 
A powerful 1.4 GHz dual-core processor easily handles simultaneous connections to keep your router running at peak performance. That last sentence is probably the one that's most accurate with no misleading information. All of the rest of it, for the average person who would read this, would be very misleading. Now, a CWNE or even a uh, CWNP professional would probably read this and see right through the fluff and understand that the reality is you're not seeing 7200 megabits per second for any client. The reality is that when you implement this four stream access point, it doesn't matter since none of your clients are four stream. That's the reality for the vast majority of home users that this is marketed to. And the same would be true for enterprise users. Now, thankfully, some enterprise vendors will tell you you can accomplish XYZ data rate, and then they'll put an asterisk after it. And then you look at the asterisk at the very bottom of the document, and it'll tell you that, well, this is going to assume you have this number of streams and you're able to do 256 QAM, which is the highest modulation that's available in 802.11ac. So the point is, enterprise documents, at least I would hope, would spend more time using the myths in print and then dispelling them in their footnotes. but in many cases they don't even do it there with enterprise equipment. So the point is this, with marketing speak such language can be quite misleading not only to the average home user or consumer in an enterprise space but even to a lot of IT professionals who are not well educated on Wi-Fi. While the represented device is a wireless router aimed mostly at the consumer market in this place, enterprise vendors love highest data rate possible marketing as well. They love to talk about that even though most of your clients are not going to be at the highest data rate. It just doesn't represent the real world. So let's get into it in more detail. So first of all then, the first of our two topics is the 802.11ac uplink requirements. And the question is why discuss it? Well, first it's important to understand the issues, to know what's going on here with this and why we're saying a faster uplink may be required in particular use cases. The big thing here is another reason to discuss it is that we should underpromise and overdeliver an implementation. We shouldn't overpromise. So if I go into an organization and I'm consulting with them for the implementation of their Wi-Fi and I tell them, hey, I've got good news for you. When we implement 802.11ac, you're going to get speeds, and I use that wonderful technology term that is pretty much meaningless, I say you're going to get speeds of up to X gigabits per second. What do they think? They think that every single client connected to that wireless network is going to get that speed. They don't know the term, but they think full duplex is what's going to happen for each and every one of those clients. So the point is that there's a misconception of the reality of the cell. When we're talking about the highest data rate even if every station in the cell is connected at that highest data rate then we're still talking about the speed of the entire cell and not the speed of a single station because they have to share airtime right so speed is this wonderful vague term you can get by with in marketing language that really doesn't mean much to us and we're planning for the real world now let me be clear I look at this as an excellent learning exercise, but I want you to know what we're not saying here. We're not attempting to say that you should implement only one gigabit per second uplinks. No, certainly not. Go ahead and implement faster uplinks if you can. You can implement multiple one gigabit per second uplinks, 10 gigabit per second uplinks, or any other speed in between. If you have them, use them. If you need them, install them. But the big thing here is I just want to emphasize even when you have those faster uplinks, you don't want to overpromise on what people can expect out of that cell. And this comes down to a fundamental understanding of Wi-Fi in general and 802.11ac specifically. So let's talk about some of this. This is a good example of a common reality today. Okay, We're looking here at data rates for 11ac in megabits per second based on 40 megahertz channels, the short guard interval of 400 nanoseconds, and three spatial streams. Now, if you don't know what all of that is, well, the 40 megahertz channel is how wide the frequency space is that we're using. The 400 nanosecond guard interval is a space of time between symbols in a frame that's being transmitted. So think of a symbol for simplicity for now as just a small part of a frame, and between those symbols we need a space, and so we're looking at 400 nanosecond guard intervals as opposed to 800 nanosecond. And then three spatial streams means that I can send three streams of data at the same time. Okay, So this is real world for some of the clients that you have, and I want to emphasize that. 
a large portion of 802.11ac clients don't even live up to this level at three spatial streams, for example. Many of them are one or two spatial streams. And in addition, we may not be using a 40 megahertz channel, but I'm giving you a potential real-world use case here. And notice that the highest possible data rate that we're going to get in this scenario is 600 megabits per second. And then they fall off to 540, 450, 405, and so forth down the line to the lowest data rate based on using 802.11ac modulation of 45 megabits per second. Now, obviously, we could still fall down to 11a rates and get 54 megabits per second and, and 48 megabits per second and so forth. But the point is, we're looking right here at just the 11ac data rates. Now, the common reality is that this is what the AP supports. So again, the clients may not support three spatial streams, and in fact, most of them probably will not in a typical deployment. And additionally, we use 20 megahertz channels a lot in enterprise deployments still, though 40 megahertz is commonly seen in office spaces today. So this is one scenario. Let's look at another scenario. Let's take it on up to wave two, four spatial streams. So we've got that wave two AP with four spatial streams. And again, we're staying real world for now, a 40 megahertz channel. And so now we go up to 800 megabits per second max data rate, falling off to 720, 600. So notice we get two data rates lower before we get to the highest data rate of three spatial streams. And then 544, 8360, and so forth down to 60 megabits per second. So as you can see, we can indeed, with a Wave 2 AP that has four spatial streams, accomplish higher maximum data rates. No question. All right, let's take a look at a totally fictitious scenario that's not at all practical and just not seen in the real world today. This time we're looking at an 80 megahertz channel, four spatial streams, 400 nanosecond guard interval. This is capable with an AP that is Wave 2, right? So a Wave 2 AP could do an 80 megahertz channel. It could do four spatial streams. Now, again, your client has to support those four spatial streams, but we're just looking at the possible, right? Now, this takes us up to 1,733.3 megabits per second max speed. And you can see then we fall off to 1,560, 1,300. We're staying above one gigabit per second data rates until we get down below the fifth data rate when we drop to 780. So this makes it look like, wow, okay, I see it. Here it is. This is why we need that faster uplink. But again, you need the clients that support these four spatial streams. And again, you need to be implementing 80 megahertz channels. The reality is that 20 and 40 megahertz channels are far more common. The reason's simple. If you implement an 80 megahertz channel, you have a lot fewer total channels available, even in 5 gigahertz. And so uh, the problem then is that frequency reuse becomes very, very challenging in these kinds of scenarios. Now, the thing that I'm doing here is just giving acknowledgement to the vendors that are saying, hey, you need more than one gigabit uplink everywhere, that it is possible to have these kinds of very high levels of throughput with an 802.11ac cell. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that everything has to line up for this, and it's just not the most common result that you see. In fact, it's an extremely rare result in the real world. So let's talk about a best case scenario. We're going to put it all out there, best case scenario, then using that 80 megahertz channel, 400 nanoseconds, four spatial streams. Best case scenario, look at our clients. I mean, all of your clients aren't going to be in that nice little center area where they're getting 256 QAM at the highest coding rate and therefore 1733.3 megabits per second, right? And even if they fall off to 256 QAM with a lower coding rate at 1560 megabits per second, again, the vast majority are not there in a, a common typical cell. Now, I understand we could do our design such that we end up being in a scenario where we have stations that are roaming away when they've fallen off to, say, 780 or 520 megabits per second, and they're going to another AP where they can get back up to 1040 or 1170 megabits per second. So I, I get that. I understand it. But what we need to understand is when you look at a diagram like this, although we don't have concentric circles in the real world, it helps us to understand the concept. As you move out from the AP, there's more square footage, if you will, that's covered by the lower data rate potential. And so there's potentially more clients in those areas than there are in the smallest coverage area. So the point is that when you look at reality, your average data rate that you're going to have across all of your client stations connected to an AP is usually going to be anywhere from three to six data rates off of the maximum data rate, 
even with a pretty good design. And so the reality becomes that even here with 80 megahertz, we're probably dropping off to somewhere around 1040 or 780, maybe even 520 as our average data rate depending on the design. And remember, we're still just talking about data rate. We're not talking about Mac efficiency. We're not talking yet about what actually goes out the back of that AP onto the wired network. Again, I'm not addressing 11A data rates here, which you could have stations even communicating at those lower data rates. I'm just sticking with 11AC data rates. And if we incorporate the possibility of 11N clients connecting as well and 11A clients connecting as well, all it does is make the scenario even worse. So we're just looking at 11AC here. So the point then is that when you look at the odds of a station actually using the highest data rate, given that you've got somewhere around 20 to 30 feet, maybe 35 feet away from the AP where you normally get those highest 256 QAM data rates. Um, walls, of course, make it so that, that distance might be shorter and so on because of attenuation. Uh, the point is that we're going to see the drop off in the data rate because of this. Now, the other factor is then that because we're using 80 megahertz channels, it becomes more difficult to implement our multiple channel architecture design. And the reality is we want a design that drives stations toward the top 50% of data rates, right? So if we just look at these data rates, we'd like to see everybody at 780 or 1,040 megabits per second and higher in this particular scenario. But when you have channels that are being redeployed, frequency that's being reused, it becomes more and more challenging to drive them to those higher data rates because of the need for SNR, signal to noise ratio or SINR. So the point is that we see data rates being pushed down in real world implementations because of the SNR factor. Now with all of that taken into consideration, let's talk about throughput reality for 802.11ac. And I've got some exaggerated numbers here. So let's take our average client data rate of 1300 megabits per second, which is an exaggerated average, 90% uh, utilization in the channel. So in other words, 90% of the time we're transmitting useful data. Um, that's exaggerated as well for most cells. Uh, and then an overhead factor. We've got 70%. So this is MAC efficiency. So we could talk about it as MAC efficiency and just say 70%. I call it the overhead factor. You can call it whatever you want to. Basically, it's the flip of management and interference overhead. So if your management and interference overhead is 30%, then the overhead factor 70%. I'm reducing what I actually have in potential throughput, or I'm dealing with my MAC efficiency here, okay? So 70% is a conservative overhead factor, meaning that it's also unlikely that I'll be able to consistently achieve this. Um, many vendors set the goal at 65% or even 60%. Okay, so what that gives me then is 819 megabits per second. Now, immediately you say, well, this is great, Tom, because you've got at least a 5 gigahertz radio on 11AC and a 2.4 gigahertz radio on 11N. And so if 11N gets 100, 120 megabits per second throughput in 2.4, which would be an amazing accomplishment there as well, and 11AC gets 819, you're real close to that gigabit per second, aren't you? And you probably need that faster uplink. Well, that's fine, but we're looking at exaggerated numbers. And even if you do uh, dual 5 gigahertz radios in an AP, both 11 AC, you'd think, well, I multiply this by 2, right? Well, you probably wouldn't because we see that performance of dual radios in the same enclosure uh, do not perform as well as being separate. So you probably wouldn't just double it. But even if we gave that, we still are looking at exaggerated reality. If we look at the real world, we'd see a number more like what we see in the bottom of the slide here. So we take a 450 megabits per second data rate. Why is that? Because we just don't have very many four spatial stream clients. We probably have mostly three spatial stream clients. We probably are not utilizing the cell at anywhere near 100%. So we'll say 70% because we're not talking potential throughput here. We're talking about what we actually push through our network, okay? And then let's say 65% for MAC efficiency or the overhead factor. That comes down to 204.75 megabits per second. That is way lower than one gigabit per second, isn't it? Now, again, I want to emphasize specific use cases could well exist where one gigabit per second uplinks would be insufficient, but it's just not the common scenario that we're going to see. 
All of this factor, by the way, of overhead, which reduces it by 30 to 40 percent or so, uh, is related to the things like co-channel interference with other cells, adjacent channel interference, which causes true interference or cancellation of signals, non-Wi-Fi interference, all of these things can come together in order to uh, end up reducing your data rates or causing frame retransmissions and so forth and therefore reducing Mac efficiency and increasing overhead. So uh, these are the factors that we're looking at here when we try to understand where we're really at with 802.11ac. So again, if we come back here to our diagram where we have all of the different devices connected to the cell, what we need to understand is that all of these devices are connecting at different data rates. We need to understand this scenario of an 80 MHz channel isn't very realistic, so even if we drop back to the 40 MHz channels with four spatial streams, you still see that we're probably realistically getting an average data rate for our stations of somewhere between 360 and 540. And if we fall back even further to three spatial streams, we're looking at somewhere between probably 270 and 405. And so the point is that we're not going to end up seeing all of these stations with the highest of data rates. Now I do want to uh, state one other factor here, and that is that we need to keep in mind the reality that a single station could indeed potentially uh, get throughput levels at some point in the future where it would be somewhere close to or in excess of one gigabits per second and by not having a one gigabits per second uplink we could end up causing that station to be throttled back but that would only be for the momentary transmit opportunity that that station is the only one sending a few frames through so again it comes back to just not the common scenario now let's move on and talk about another topic and then we'll come back and kind of bring it all together and that's multi-user MIMO. I'm not going to get into extreme technical detail related to multi-user MIMO today. We're keeping this down to around a 30 minute or so webinar, 30 to 40 minutes. But I do want to address this because it's another common feature that's listed as improving performance of our Wi-Fi. So the way it works is simple in a definition. The AP transmits frames to multiple clients concurrently rather than in sequence. Okay, so we send frames to two or more st stations at the same time. But we need to understand there are some basic requirements for multi-user MIMO to work. First of all, the clients have to support it. Then you need the right conditions for grouping so that we can put them in groups and then transmit to them concurrently. We need fairly stationary clients. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then we need data destined for multiple clients in the group so that we have something to send to them. So let's talk about each of these issues and it will begin to show us the reality statistically that multi-user MIMO is beneficial. It can improve efficiency of airtime utilization, but it's not as impacting as one might think at first glance. So first of all, client support for multi-user MIMO. It uses explicit beam forming, and that means that it sends out frames to learn about the client conditions. And the client must support transmit beam forming in response to these sounding frames. It's not that the client is necessarily doing transmit beam forming, it's that it has to have support for these sounding frames and responding to these sounding frames. And older clients just don't support it. Uh, a lot of 802.11ac uh, wave 1 clients won't support it, and 11n and earlier clients uh, may not support it or won't. And so the issue then is that we have to have clients that support this first before we can use it. Obviously the AP has to support it as well, but again what we're looking at is the potential of upgrading our AP and what we'll get out of that. So the percentage of clients supporting multi-user MIMO in most environments today is still very low. This will change over time, so I want to keep it real world, and over time we'll see more and more stations in our networks that support multi-user MIMO as we upgrade client devices and so forth, and that's the way it happens. It's not that we're going to upgrade the operating system or upgrade the firmware or something like that, and then all of a sudden we have multi-user MIMO support in the vast majority of scenarios. Instead, it's going to be that we replace hardware, and then we have multi-user MIMO support. So the required client support, it needs to support the 802.11ac5. It has to do transmit beamforming responses and both being capable of it and actually supporting it. And uh, single stream clients can participate. So uh, some people have some confusion about the issue and think that the reality is that only um, uh, multiple stream clients can be multi-user MIMO targets, and that's not the case. 
Now, this next factor is multi-user MIMO groups. So this is something that takes place inside of the AP, or potentially a controller, but it takes place within the management of the Wi-Fi in the cell. And basically, the way it works is the AP will put multiple stations that support this in a group. And then this is going to be based on the conditions of those stations. And these conditions, by the way, are called channel state information, or CSI. Maybe more than two in the group. A uh, maximum of three multi-user MIMO client transmissions are recommended by most for best performance, but up to four could happen. And so the point is that we have to have a group. So this is one of the constraints of multi-user MIMO. The stations have to be able to be grouped together such that they can receive multi-user MIMO transmissions concurrently. I can't just randomly say it'll work for every station that's connected to the AP. And therefore, we have this extra constraint, which again reduces statistically the amount of times we can use multi-user MIMO to communicate with clients. Now, it's not that the stations have to be on the other side of the AP from each other. Uh, they could be closer to each other, but it's just the RF conditions of the client have to be such that there can be separation based on the, the phase manipulation that's used in multi-user MIMO uh, so that there's signal separation and the signals can be processed. Okay, So this is one of the constraints of multi-user MIMO. Another thing is stationary clients. This isn't as dressed as often, and it's not at all a requirement that the clients be stationary. But remember, what happens when multi-user MIMO is used? The AP learns about the client conditions, the CSI. And if the client moves, what happens? The conditions or the CSI change. And so therefore, they may not be able to participate in the multi-user MIMO group that they were in before once they have moved. Now, the AP will re-evaluate periodically, we're talking potentially every few milliseconds, the state of that client, getting that sounding information, and making sure that the conditions are still appropriate for receiving these frames. This overhead is real, but most vendors say it's somewhere less than 1% of airtime. But more and more stations using multi-user MIMO could make this an important factor. An additional thing to consider is that when frames fail, because there's no acknowledgement that comes back to the AP from the client station. Because remember, multi-user MIMO is downstream only at this point. So from the AP to the client. So the client doesn't send back an ACK or an acknowledgement. And so the AP has to resend the frame. So when this kind of thing happens, if it was attempting to do it in a multi-user MIMO transmission, the question then is, what, what does the AP do? Do we lower the data rate? Do we remove the station from the multi-user MIMO group? Do we perform a, a new transmit beamforming sounding exchange? Or do we just completely disallow participation? Maybe we say that station has moved from one multi-user MIMO group to another so many times, I'm saying now I'm done with this. We're not going to allow that station to participate anymore. Again, the standard does not specify what must happen here. The standard just says, hey, we can send to multiple stations at the same time. It's up to the AAP vendors, their secret sauce, for how they're going to deal with the issue of the changing CSI, the changing uh, uh, channel state for that receiving client if they're moving around. So this becomes a factor as well to consider with multi-user MIMO. And then you have the final note of the fact that you need data for multi-user MIMO group clients. So we have our multi-user MIMO groups. We need to have data since we only have station one and station two in group one, station three and station four in group two, we need data that's destined for both Station 1 and Station 2 in order to actually have something to send. And the same thing with 3 and 4. So here uh, on this slide, I have just an example of potential ingress traffic. So we've got a frame for Station 1, then one for Station 2. Great. We could buffer and transmit both at the same time. Then we've got Station 4, then Station 2, then Station 1. Maybe we do a single-user MIMO transmission to Station 4, and then we do a multi-user MIMO transmission to Station 2 and Station 1. Okay, But we've only got four stations in this cell. And depending on what's going on, we may find it rare that we have a lot of frames destined for these different stations that are in the same multi-user MIMO group. Because there's no reason to send 
a completely null empty frame to station one because I happen to have a frame for station two. I might as well use a single user MIMO frame to station two because I have better SNR for that anyway and I could probably send it at a higher data rate for that one station. So that's an issue that you have to keep in mind. And we have to think about what kind of data we're using in the cell. And is it going to contribute to the scenario where there are multiple frames available for multiple stations in the same multi-user MIMO group at the same time? You know, a good example of this would be a scenario where you are doing some type of uh, streaming to multiple stations of the exact same data in the exact same room. Uh, in that kind of scenario, you may very well see you've got a lot of opportunity for using multi-user MIMO. But when you've got multiple users in an office space, checking email, getting on Twitter, checking their Facebook, I know we don't ever do that at work, and it, all the other varied items and tasks that they might be performing, uh, you may or may not have as frequent scenarios where you have data destined to those multiple stations. So the AP is going to have to have some kind of a buffer method rather than direct forwarding, at least for some delay to let frames come in through the Ethernet interface that are destined to the stations. But the point is that this is another issue that affects the statistical reality of the performance gains we get from multi-user MIMO. By the way, it's also important for the greatest efficiency to understand that frames should be relatively the same size for ultimate airtime optimization. So if I'm taking a transmit opportunity for multi-user MIMO and I'm sending frames to two stations and one frame is very small and the other one is large, then the reality is it's possible that I could get better performance out of that scenario by sending them in sequence using single-user MIMO if the one frame is large enough and the other one is small enough. These are the algorithms, of course, that the AP is going to have to decide upon to figure out when it's best to actually use it and when it's not. And it is a potential opportunity for differentiation in overall performance among the different vendors with their, again, secret sauce that they use on the inside of the access points. So what is the one result of all of this? As we're talking about 802.11ac and uh, data rates and throughput expectations and uplink requirements, and also multi-user MIMO. Well, let me give you the results. 802.11ac is far better than PASS 5s. There's no question. But it does not give the improvements in actual throughput that many expect due to information often distributed or improperly understood about the technology. So what do we mean by that? Well, in the end, remember, data rates do not equal throughput. That's your data rate on the phi link. And that does not equal throughput because the station has to get airtime. And then when it gets airtime, it can send at that data rate, but then it may not get airtime for quite a while again, and then it gets it again. Now, when I say quite a while, I'm talking milliseconds in most cases. So data rates are simple in comparison to understanding throughput, and throughput is complex. Now, I say data rates are simple. It can be complicated to understand from, which, uh, from what a data rate is derived. Uh, modulation, coding schemes, short guard interval versus long guard interval, channel bandwidth, etc. So there are a lot of factors that do impact data rates, granted. But throughput is complex because it becomes a factor, particularly when you're talking about the one uplink port or more coming out of the back of the AP. Throughput is now a factor of not one client and its data rate. It's a factor of all the clients and their data rate. It's uh, varied data rates all across the cell. Uh, it's a factor of interference, both co-channel interference where we're just waiting on another frame to stop so we can send our frame, adjacent channel interference and non-Wi-Fi non interference, all of that. And then 802.11 management overhead is still there. So in the end, throughput definitely does not equal data rates, and it usually doesn't come close to data rates. But 802.11 AC is better than past FIs in hardware. Why? Data rates are higher, so we do have the potential for higher data rates. Even when we're not getting the highest data rate, they're still potentially higher than previous data rates. Multi-user MIMO does provide incremental gains, so we get an efficiency gain there if it's implemented appropriately from the vendor. But also, we just have we always get better, right? So chipsets are improved, antenna design is improved. And this is the way I look at it. Think about CPUs in computers. We have, over the years, developed faster and faster CPUs with more and more capabilities and features, 
as we've learned more in the industry, right? And the same thing is true with chipsets. So an 802.11ac Wave 1 chipset that comes out today may not be as good as an 802.11ac uh, Wave 1 chipset that comes out in three years, right? Uh, or a Wave 2 chipset. But the point is that we get better at building chipsets. Antenna design, we get better at determining how to implement the antennas inside of our access points. Um, better at implementing filtering inside of our access points and so forth. So the better design by itself equates to better potential results even for our non 802.11 AC clients that are out there. So AC is definitely better file. We have better hardware than we've had in the past. So there are benefits of AC and I don't want anyone to go away from this webinar thinking that we're saying they're not. There are great benefits to it. But again, when we come back to that uplink, things can be very, very different when we look at this. So the moral of the story is that if we want to understand our need on the wired uplink from the access point. We need to first understand the reality of communications on the wireless link. And I think, as I said, this gives us a great learning experience or opportunity to understand those very issues.